The other day I was having lunch at a Thai restaurant in Dublin city centre. And there was an 11-month-old girl with her parents at the next table. The dad put a little board book in front of her, but her mom's iPhone was within reach. She picked up the iPhone and within seconds she had opened and shut two apps and found the one she wanted to play. I was delighted that it wasn't Angry Birds. I'll give you another example. My neighbor told me his four-year-old grandson showed him how to use several features he didn't even know he had on his new iPhone. So this ginger baby in a green t-shirt is not an anomaly. I found him on a blog called Suburban Jungle that shared an article by neuroscientist Susan Greenfield. The article was called How Modern Technology is Changing the Way the Brain Works. It's linked at the end of this presentation if you want to have a read. Listen to the title again, How Modern Technology is Changing the Way the Brain Works. Seriously, our mental wiring is going through a transformation, an evolution thanks to the silicon chip. We live in amazing times. Many of you are a bit younger than I am, so you climbed on the logarithmic technology curve a bit later than me. I suppose for you, moving vertically feels normal. This graph is from a Business Insider article from April 2012. Gartner IDC produced the graph. That's a pretty steep curve, but the real curve is probably steeper than the projection, since uptake on tablets has been even greater than expected. When I was a child, to speak to someone on the phone, you picked up the handset, waited for the operator, and then told her the number, EL40860. My three-year-old big sister did that to call my grandmother one day when my mother was in the basement getting clothes out of the dryer. Grammy pan panicked and Kathy got into big trouble. This little guy is not doing anything different, he just has a different tool. He would probably use FaceTime to contact his grandmother so she'd see where he was and where his parents were as well. It really wasn't that long ago when a phone was two chunks of metal attached to each other by a wire with another wire attached to the wall and all that it did was move sound from one place to another. But for each of these children, this one, this little boy and my sister, the impulse was the same. You see parents doing something and you want to try it yourself. These new humans do not know how much more they're being exposed to when they play with the phone than previous generations were. Their thirsty, pliable brains are oblivious to the enormous volume of information coming at them, and they're open to all comers. Humor me while I reminisce a little more. My first TV was black and white, and there were, was only a snowy signal for a few hours a day, and there were only three channels. This little guy has thousands of images in living color and all on demand at his fingertips, or his thumb pads if you look at the technique he uses. He has a phone and a television to the nth power, as well as many other things in that tiny piece of plastic, silicon, and metal. For me, it would be information overload. It is information overload. I call it infolution. But he is completely okay with it, because he knows no different, there's no turning back, and he's got lots of room in his little brain pan. Many folks my age may very well live to see 100 years old or more. And we can either throw up our hands and become Luddites, refusing to try to keep up, or we can make some kind of an effort to maintain a connection, some kind of two-way street between the generations. And it has to be a two-way street because I doubt very much that they will be willing to let go of what is in their grasp, to spit out what they have already tasted. Their thirsty minds are filling up fast with images and sounds in virtual space and they have room in their brains to store it, to store all of it at the beginning. We are having trouble to try to keep up, at least I am, because our hard drives are so full that we can't defragment them anymore and we're afraid to or don't know how to delete files or overwrite them. And as much as we, my generation, may be appalled or terrified by this reality, the babies don't see it the way we do. The virtual world is not the new normal, it is normal, and it's all they know. The world population today includes the greatest generation, or the traditionalists, the boomers, Gen Xers, millennials, Generation Z, 
and the current de generation. I call them either the double A's, as in batteries, or the silicon greens, maybe. We're all walking the planet, but in different but related realities. And we need to find a way to make this work. Before we decide what we should do about this, and we should definitely think carefully about what we should and should not do about this, we need to look at what has come before. I am a speech-language specialist, so the first thing I want to look at is interpersonal communication. In the past, babies' and young children's minds were filled up with human voices and real people and objects, not pixels in handheld devices. An interesting study of language acquisition was done recently by a woman named Patricia Cool. Her TED talk about the research can be seen at the link I post here. She talks at length about how amazing, agile, and flexible the human mind is, especially up to the age of seven. After seven, the consensus is that many doors to developing language are closed, if not locked. A bit depressing to look at, isn't it? but I'm sure there are some determined souls who can either pick those locks or find a way back in to acquiring language, whether it's first or second in later years, or repair the damage caused by strokes or other trauma. But it is clear that the easiest and most rapid spoken language acquisition comes in the early years. And the acquisition is statistically more efficient in real time with real people speaking to the children than via TV or other media, no matter how much we love Sesame Street or Dora Explora or Peppa Pig or the rest. The jury is still out on where interactive apps fit in this picture, but it's unlikely that they'll trump human interaction for the majority of learners. We want to take advantage of that window of opportunity for speech, don't we? Because man is a social animal, right? Sherry Turkle, who in 1997 was incredibly positive about the word World Wide Web and the new digital technology, is not very enthusiastic about it anymore. She gave a talk titled Alone Together at a TED in February of 2012. Her concern is that the illusion of closeness created by texting and Facebook is dangerous and insufficient. However, as Orson Welles said, we're born alone, we live alone, we die alone. Only through our love and friendship can we create the illusion, for the moment, that we're not alone. So are we already operating under an illusion? And is one illusion any better than another? There are many ways to create the illusion of togetherness. And Eric Whitaker has created one through a virtual choir that is quite amazing. 3,000 singers all over the world recorded themselves singing to a video of Whitaker directing the piece he had composed. They uploaded their voices to his website, and an editor cut them all together to create the finished piece. These people share a potent connection in something other than real time. Does that make them any less connected? So... Man is a social animal that is driven to communicate with others. Interpersonal communication is an illusion. Both physical reality and virtual reality can create the illusion of social interaction. Let's refer back to the topic question. Who teaches whom? Everybody teaches each other? Acceptable answer? What do we teach, though, and when, and how, and what are the consequences of our choices? The brain cells we use grow and interconnect with each other. The ones that are neglected die off or are stunted. Different areas of the brain store different kinds of information. If an area is stunted, we currently believe that there's no other place to store what was, in what was intended to go there. If Broca's area or Wernicke's area are damaged or do not develop, speech is affected. If regions of the frontal lobe are damaged or stunted, emotions and inhibitions are damaged. In the same way, playing a violin or piano at an early age lays down a robust platform not only for reading music, but also for mathematics. 
Until the age of seven, the brain is ripe for rapid development, and the brain needs time to rest, to organize, and to finalize the incoming information. There's not time nor is there room in the skull to grow all of the cells in all of the areas. Which tree do we want to grow? And whose decision is it? People of the greatest generation, the traditionalists, are good conversationalists and storytellers. They paint pictures with words and have a knack for narrative storylines that include plot, character, and moral content. They're happy to sit and read a 500-page book if their eyes haven't failed them yet. They enjoy a walk in the woods and probably know how to grow vegetables and tie lots of different kinds of knots. People from the boomer generation describe the world through spoken and written language. They tend to see the world as shades of gray, not black and white. However, they want to shape their worlds and are concerned about justice and about having it all. They'll be as happy watching the movie as reading the book. A treadmill is as likely to be a source of exercise as a walk. Many Gen Xers were latchkey children with two working parents or single parents. They didn't come from large families or live near extended family, so their family-based interpersonal skills would not be as developed as in the previous two generations. They're likely to have a family of friends who are from different cultures, so they don't have a set, of code, a set code of morals or social conventions to rely on when interacting with others. They'd be most comfortable with small talk and with sound bites. The millennials, or Generation Y, have a stronger and a different relationship with their parents than the traditional parent-child's relationships of the past. They tend to see their teachers as facilitators rather than instructors. They have less interest in communication through written language, relying more on PowerPoint presentations with large amounts of graphics and videos, etc., to share information. Watching movies and TV on Netflix or reading Kindle versions would be more frequent choices than reading a physical book or watching the same TV show with others from start to finish. Texting is easier than phoning someone or speaking in person. A large proportion of Generation Z are less physically active than the previous generations despite the large number of sport and leisure centers and opportunities to do novel extreme sports like paragliding and wall climbing. This generation, even more than the one before, uses internet dating sites to find life partners and uses social media to create a virtual family and friend network. Their attention spans remain short partly because they're always multitasking. Often they text while watching a movie and eating dinner. Which characteristics of each of these generations do you want the Silicon Greens to share? Do you provide the opportunities to let each individual indicate which most interests him or her? The board book versus the iPhone? The video versus a sheet of paper and a box of crayons? Or do we make sure that each generation shares what they care about with the new generation so we create an interconnectedness among all of us?